What does the last book of the Bible really teach about the temple? The answer will surprise you in this edition of His Voice Today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. What does the Bible really teach about the temple? The title of this program is called Sanctuary Secrets. I grew up in California. Uh, the capital of California is in Sacramento. I'm an American citizen, and the capital, it's no secret, of the United States government is in Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, God has a government, and he also has an administrative center of all of his major activities that he is trying to accomplish in this world. And that administrative headquarters, which we are about to see from God's book, is the temple, the temple of God. Now, to give you some background as we build up to the book of Revelation, let's go back to the Old Testament. When Israel came out of Egypt in the time of Moses, God parted the Red Sea, he brought them through, and then he brought them to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, God spoke from heaven to Moses and thus to the Israelites, and he told them to let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God told the Israelites to build this structure, which was called the tabernacle or the temple or the sanctuary. Uh, the, it had a number of different rooms and different uh, ministries and different compartments. It had a, a white curtain all around the outside of this building, which was called the courtyard or it enclosed the courtyard inside the courtyard. There was an altar called the altar burnt offering. There was a laver where the priests would wash their, their feet and their hands. And then going inside of the building, which was the actual tabernacle itself, there were two rooms. One room was called the holy place, which had a number of articles of furniture. There was a, a candlestick, a seven-branched candlestick. There was a table of bread and a golden altar of incense. And then if you remove the curtain and go into the second room, which was the inner room, it was called the Most Holy Place. And inside that room, there was a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant. It had a golden lid on top of it called the Mercy Seat. It had two golden angels coming up from the edges of the Mercy Seat. In the middle of these angels was a light called the Shekinah, which was the presence of God. And underneath the Mercy Seat, were a number of articles, and the most important article of furniture inside of the most holy place were two tables of stone. And I've got my own copies here. Two tables of testimony, solid rock, written with the finger of God, the Ten Commandments. We read this in the book of Exodus and also in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. It talks about the Big Ten have to be careful when I handle these. Now what happened in the wilderness when the Israelites were instructed by Moses concerning the tabernacle and its services, if an Israelite broke one of the big ten, one of the ten commandments that was placed inside the ark in the most holy place, he was instructed to bring an animal of sacrifice. He went into the courtyard area and the priest handed him a knife. He took, let's say it was a lamb, and he put his hand upon the head of this lamb and he pointed it toward the most holy place where the law was that he had broken. And then the priest handed him a knife and uh, it was a bloody ritual. I'm glad I, I don't have to do this. I'm glad we don't have to do this today. But he had to take the knife and put it under the, underneath the throat of the animal after he put his hands on its head and confessed his sins over it, transferring his sins symbolically to the animal. Then he took the knife and he, maybe he said a prayer, I think I would have. And he, maybe he closed his eyes, I think I would have. And then he slit the throat of that animal and the animal died instead of the person for breaking the Ten Commandments that were in the most holy place. Those among the Israelites who had spiritual discernment and who understood the prophecies that God had been trying to communicate to Israel and to the world understood that that innocent sacrifice pointed forward to Jesus Christ and to his sacrifice as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. The priest back in the wilderness would then have a little basin and he would catch the blood as it dripped down from the neck of the animal 
and he would then go into this building called the tabernacle or the sanctuary. Um, he would wash his feet to make sure that he was clean, and he would go in and he would sprinkle the blood on or around the altar of incense. There were four horns on this altar, and him sprinkling the blood with his finger uh, represented the sin being transferred from the sinner to the animal into the blood and then into the sanctuary. And this happened day after day after day throughout the, the year that the Israelites were instructed to perform certain rituals during their sanctuary year. And symbolically, the sanctuary was represented as being defiled because all this sin was pouring in to the sanctuary through the blood of the sacrifices that were then, that was then sprinkled on the altar. This went on throughout the year until one particular day of the year called the Day of Atonement. It was really the, uh, the high day in the season of God's festivals. And what happened on that day was of the utmost importance. In fact, it was so important that the Lord instructed the priests prior to the Day of Atonement to blow the trumpets. And so they blew them for 10 days. And the Israelites could hear these trumpets sounding all around the camp. And they knew when those trumpets sounded that they had 10 days to get ready for the most important day of the year, which was, uh, as Jewish people call it today, Yom Kippur, which was the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, not just a regular priest, but the high priest alone, he made a sacrifice, he took blood, and he went into the building, not just the holy place, but then he lifted the second curtain. There were two curtains, one into the holy place and one into the most holy place. He lifted the second curtain and he went right in to the very presence of God. Now there is a, uh, a Jewish tradition that they tied a rope around the high priest's leg because if he died in the most holy place because he wasn't spiritually prepared to enter the presence of God, then they could pull him out. I don't really know if that's true or not, but that's, that's a, a common story that I have heard. The high priest had to be ready for the Day of Atonement. I'm sure that he prepared his heart, or at least he should have. And then he took the blood of the sacrifice, and this is all described in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And then what he did was he took the blood of the sacrifice, he went right in to the presence of God, and he sprinkled it seven times on top of the mercy seat, the golden lid, underneath which was the Ten Commandments. Leviticus 16, 14 says that he would sprinkle with his finger the blood upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Going down to verse 30, it tells us, God told the Israelites that on that day, which was the Day of Atonement, shall the priest, the high priest, make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So the main purpose of the cleansing of the temple, of the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement was not just to cleanse a building because all the sins had been symbolically going in there, but the main reason was to cleanse the people. God said to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus tells us, was also considered to be a day of judgment. Leviticus 23, verse 29, tells us that whatever soul it be of the Israelites that would not afflict himself or humble himself in that same day, he would be cut off from among his people. So when the Israelites knew that the high priest went into the most holy place and with his finger he sprinkled that cleansing blood on top of the Ten Commandments or on top of the golden lid underneath which were the Ten Commandments, they were to understand that the purpose of this ritual was that their hearts might be cleansed from all sin. And if there were Israelites that really didn't care about God or about the law or about the uh, sacrificial blood or what the high priest was doing behind that second curtain, and if they just, you know, uh, took it lightly and didn't really have any interest in the activities of the Day of Atonement, uh, the Bible says that they were to be cut off from among the people. So essentially, the Day of Atonement was a day where people had a choice to be cleansed from their sins through the blood that pointed forward to the blood of Jesus, 
or they would be cut off and separated from Israel. Now, that's what happened throughout Old Testament history. The temple, the tabernacle, the wilderness tabernacle was eventually moved into uh, the promised land and it was eventually built up into a permanent structure. Uh, in the days of Solomon, it was destroyed by the Babylonians, but then it was rebuilt in the days of Ezra and it was uh, a temple. Uh, in the time of Jesus, Jesus went into that temple many times. He did many things. He cleansed the temple of the buying and the selling and things that were going on there. And then after Jesus died and rose from the dead and went to heaven in the year 70 AD, the Roman, the Roman armies came, surrounded Jerusalem. They broke through the walls. Uh, it's a very tragic event in history, but they burned the temple down to the ground. And today, if you were to get on a plane and fly over to Israel, the only uh, remnant of what remained, or at least what used to be on side the Temple Mount, inside the Temple Mount, or on the Temple Mount, is this golden dome called the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim building and that's all that's left. Uh, at least that's what remains today. And there's a lot of uh, discussion among Christians. Uh, is the temple going to be rebuilt? Somehow the Dome of the Rock, will it be blown up by some kind of Israeli attack or an earthquake or something so that the Jewish people can rebuild that temple? Well, uh, I've done a lot of research on this topic. I've written a number of books on this, but let me just tell you one thing quickly, and that is that if the Jewish people ever did rebuild a temple on the Temple Mount inside Jerusalem, uh, it certainly would not be a temple to honor God. And the reason is because if they restarted sacrifices and started killing animals, uh, those sacrifices would be a denial of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It would be denial of what Jesus did when he died on the cross and said, it is finished and that there are to be no more sacrifices. So what about the temple? Does the New Testament teach that there uh, is another temple? Will it be rebuilt on earth? Or what does Revelation, or, or what does the New Testament say? The question, how will the world end, is one of the most searched topics on Google, revealing that a lot of people are looking at things happening in the world, and they sense something big and decisive is about to take place. Steve's pocketbook, The End of the World, Fact or Fiction, deals with this important topic about the end of the world. Order your free copy today by calling 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-782-4253. Or visit hisvoicetoday.com. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now, of the things which we have spoken, Paul said, this is the sum. This is the bottom line. This is the most important conclusion. We have such a high priest. We do today who was set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, this verse is talking about a heavenly temple, a sanctuary in the heavens, and about a high priest that is up there, and that high priest is Jesus Christ. And he is now a minister in the true tabernacle which God pitched and not man. So obviously this temple is not on earth. This temple is up above. Now let's go to the book of Revelation because Revelation is an amazing book that walks you through the sanctuary. In Revelation chapter 1, it starts out with a focus, among other things, on the sacrifice of Jesus. Revelation 1 verse 5 talks about how this book is from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So Revelation starts with a focus on the cross. Jesus died on the cross and he washed us from our sins in his blood. And the cross was represented by the altar of burnt offering in the courtyard in Old Testament days outside of the sanctuary. When the animals died, those animals pointed forward to the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, when you move farther in to Revelation, when you go to chapter, or chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12, John heard a voice behind him. He turned around. He's in vision. This was approximately the year 96 AD. Many scholars, uh, at least that's the traditional date for the writing of the book of Revelation. John was on the island of Patmos. He was a prisoner. Uh, of the Roman government, government because he was a strong follower of Jesus, so they banished him to the island. And he turned around and he heard a voice and behind him he saw a being who said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. 
And as he turned around, verse 12 says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, having he was clothed with a garment down to his foot and girt about with a golden girdle. So Revelation 1 finds John in vision. He's taken uh, up into heaven through the Holy Spirit, and he's taken where he sees Jesus. And Jesus is dressed like a priest, like a high priest. And he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks point to the holy place. This is basically temple imagery that's based upon the Old Testament, but now it's woven into the book of Revelation. As we continue to read in chapter 4, we go deeper into Revelation, and many things happen. I don't have time to read the whole book. But in chapter 4, verse 1, John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So he's taken again uh, up in a vision, and he's taken into a room. It's a beautiful room. It's a throne room. And in verse 5, the Bible says, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So a door is open and John is taken in, and the imagery is the holy place. He sees seven golden candlesticks, which were in the holy place in the earthly tabernacle, and they are burning before the throne. And he sees Jesus, and he sees, he sees three manifestations of the power of God. He sees uh, thunder, voices, and lightning. Now remember that. There are three manifestations. Actually, let me uh, correct myself. He didn't actually see Jesus in chapter 4. He saw him in chapter 5. But we see three manifestations at the candlestick. Thunder, lightnings, and voices. Now this is very significant because when you move in farther into Revelation and you get to chapter 8, what happens is John is again taken up in vision. And in verse 3, Revelation 8, verse 3, another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So now he's, he's still in the holy place. Instead of the lampstand, he sees the golden altar, the altar of incense. And smoke comes up. It says the smoke of the incense. In verse 5, it says there were voices, thunderings, and lightnings, and now there's a fourth manifestation. There's an earthquake. So at the candlestick, there's three manifestations, and then John moves farther into Revelation, and he sees four manifestations of the power of God. Now when you go deeper into Revelation and get to chapter 11, verse 19, this is really amazing. In Revelation 11:19, the Bible says, that the temple of God was opened. It's opened again, and it's opened in heaven. So this is a heavenly temple. This is the center of God's administrative activity in this world. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. Now, if you count these manifestations you discover that now there are five. In chapter 4, there's three at the lampstand. In chapter 8, there are four as you get to the golden altar of incense. And in chapter 11, verse 19, there are five manifestations of the power of God as you get into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That's what this verse is pointing us to. And that's why all the fireworks are there thunder, voices, lightning, earthquake, great hail, and the ark is seen. And based upon what we read in the Old Testament, what was in that ark? What is in that ark? This verse is pointing us to the Ten Commandments, to God's law in the most holy place up above of the heavenly temple where Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Now as you keep reading, the line of thought in Revelation 14, verse 7, then tells us that an announcement is made. And the announcement is, Fear God and give glory to Him, 
for the hour of his judgment is come. Just like in the Old Testament, in the Levitical system, there was the daily service that happened throughout the year where the people offered their sacrifices, the blood went into the holy place, and then there was the Day of Atonement in the most holy place at the end of the year, uh, preceded by the blowing of the trumpets, when the high priest went in and with the blood sprinkled it with his fingers seven times upon the golden mercy seat underneath which was the Ten Commandments, and people had to make a choice. Were they going to, were they going to follow their high priest by faith in the most holy place, and were they going to participate in the cleansing work that he was trying to accomplish through the administration of the blood so that they could be clean from all their sins before the Lord? Or would they just uh, you know, be lazy and not care about what the priest was doing, what the high priest was doing? And in that case, they would then be cut off. So in the Old Testament, it was a time of judgment. And it's the same thing in Revelation. When you read Revelation carefully, chapter 1 starts at the cross. Chapter 4 takes us into the holy place with the seven can't seven branch candlestick with three manifestations of the power of God. Chapter 8 takes us into the, uh, again into the holy place with the golden altar of incense with four manifestations of the power of God. And then chapter 11, verse 19, 19 takes us into the most holy place where the temple is open and the ark is seen and there are five manifestations of the power of God showing us that the most holy place up in heaven, the heavenly temple where Jesus Christ, our high priest is, is the administrative headquarters of God Almighty. It is the place where Jesus Christ himself is now ministering his shed blood for you and for me. And we need to understand this. We need to understand what the Bible says, that Jesus Christ is our high priest up there and he is ministering his blood in your behalf and in my behalf. He wants to cleanse us, just like in Old Testament days, they pointed to the reality of Jesus wanting to cleanse a people from all their sins to prepare us for his return. That's what Revelation is really all about. In the book of Matthew, at the end of his life, chapter 26, verse 28, Jesus met with his disciples, he broke the bread, and he passed out the juice. And he said to his disciples, the night before he died, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant that was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, that would be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus knew that the blood of the animals, all the animals that were slain all throughout Old Testament history, that they all pointed forward to his own sacrifice, to, to the time when he would shed his own blood upon the cross. And he knew that after he died, he would rise, he would go to heaven, he would give the book of Revelation to John, he would try to lead people uh, from the cross into the holy place and finally into the most holy place where his final ministration would be carried out in behalf of human beings inside that administrative uh, headquarters, inside the heavenly temple above where Jesus is now ministering his blood in our behalf. Jesus knew all that. And he wants us to know it because we are now in the final time of cleansing. Cleansing by the blood of Jesus or being cut off if we, if we don't care. I heard a story once about Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer in the 1500s. He went to bed one night and he had a dream. In his dream, he saw the devil. The devil walked up to him with a big scroll in his hand and and uh, the devil looked at Luther and he said, Martin Luther, he said, look at this scroll. He said, are these your sins? And Luther looked and he could see, yes, on the scroll were written all the sins of his life. And the devil said, Luther, do you know what the wages of sin is? And Luther said, yes, I do. This was all in the dream. And the devil said, what are the wages of sin? And Luther said, the wages of sin is death because Luther knew the Bible. And the devil started laughing, ha, ha, ha. And then Luther noticed in his dream that the devil had his fingers and they were covering something that was on top of the scroll. And Luther looked at the devil and said, Satan, move your hand. What, what's, what's, what, are you what are your fingers covering? And the devil said, I won't. And Luther said, move your hand. And the devil said, I won't. And Martin Luther waxed bold and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to move your hand and show me what's under there. And when the devil finally heard that, he had no choice. He moved his hand. And there was a Bible verse under there from Revelation, no, I'm sorry, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. 
And this is the part that was there. It says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And Luther looked at that, looked at the devil, and he said, the devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, be gone. I know I've sinned, but I've repented, and I trust in the blood of Jesus, and Jesus' blood has cleansed me from all my sin. And Satan had to leave. He had no choice. He couldn't hang around because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. The last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 10, says, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of, of this book, for the time is at hand. Verse 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He which is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he which is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, the time is coming when eventually all mankind will be divided into two groups. Those who are cleansed and holy and righteous, or those who are filthy, still the door has closed. Just like on the Day of Atonement. They're either cleansed or cut off. And then verse 12 says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus is up in the most holy place right now, and soon everybody will have made their choice to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus or to be cut off. To be cleansed from all their sins of breaking his law or to choose to continue on with sin and the devil and the ways of the world. And once everybody's made their choice, then Jesus is going to come down from heaven and he's going to get his people who have chosen to follow him, who love him, who appreciate his cross, who appreciate his blood, who appreciate his sacrifice, and who want to live with him forever. Behold, I come quickly, Jesus says. Blessed is he who keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You have just heard his voice from the Bible today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg.